In this video, we're going to go over Sumerian writing, how to read and write it. Oh, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're not going to go too in-depth. I'm not going to cover every glyph or anything like that. Um, just the basics of the system so that as we go, we can then add things onto it. Um, so first of all, Sumerian is written with cuneiform. Um, <clears throat> cuneiform is like all uh, writing systems essentially defined by its medium. Um, so the way that the appearance and characteristics of a Chinese script are defined in different periods by the fact that it was written on um, essentially bones, strips of bamboo, and then later on silk. And that's what gives it its characteristic appearance. And modern typefaces have diverged from um, older typefaces um, because of the advent of computers. Um, similarly, the Latin alphabet, uh, it looks the way it looks because um, <clears throat> because we have essentially adapted the monumental uh, Latin alphabet to computers. So the medium of computers have changed it. The medium of inscribing things on stone um, influenced the monumental appearance. And during medieval times, um, the medium of uh, essentially ink on uh, velum uh, changed the Latin alphabet to where it appeared a certain way. So very in, cuneiform is very influenced by by its medium. Um, its medium was clay tablets. So they, a stylus was used, a reed stylus was used to inscribe <clears throat> um, to inscribe uh, certain shapes on clay. Um, it has various stages. Very early on, it appeared more liney, and then later on, um, we start we started to see. <clears throat> um, very formalized um, wedge shapes and there are wedges throughout the whole period but we see a lot more um, preference essentially for lines um, that don't have the sort of characteristic wedge kind of appearance very early on also in some media it was um, inscribed uh, not in clay sometimes it was not inscribed on or written on clay was inscribed on other materials, in which case um, that medium also influences and allows the um, writing to have more of a sort of liney and less of a wedge-shaped appearance. Cuneiform means wedge-shaped, and that's because that's these examples that I'll show you will, will make it clear why um, there was such a, a prevalence of wedge shapes within it. So uh, first off, we have some um, early cuneiform here. Uh, you notice it's essentially just a bunch of lines. Um, some some of these appear to have sort of filled in spaces. And there are some sort of wedge shapes here. We have a dingier sign. You can see if you sort of look at it really closely that there are, there are some uh, wedge shaped portions of it. Um, <clears throat> but most of the lines and fewer wedge shapes. Here, even in the dingier sign, uh, we have um, fewer wedge shapes and mostly lines. Um, and these, I believe this one is actually stone, although it might be clay, and this appears to be metal. Um, so you can see that the medium does influence it quite a bit. Actually, this, this is probably clay. I'm just making stuff up. But these are earlier, um, appear to be earlier inscriptions. Here uh, we have the Akkadian syllabary, um, and this is essentially transcribed by a, a person, so these are not... Um, these are just artistic representations of it. You can see very clearly the wedge, the wedge shapes <clears throat> that give cuneiform its name. And this was Akkadian, the Akkadian syllabary. So there's overlap with uh, Sumerian, but the important thing here is that um, this is stylized, and this is these are phonetic elements of Akkadian essentially. <clears throat> um, but you can see they have very clear wedge shapes. Um, <clears throat> Here we have a, a portion of a clay tablet with also some very clear, um, very wedge-like shapes <clears throat> Sorry, within it. Um, obviously, it's very uh, fairly destroyed, <laughs> so um, a lot of it's missing. But over here, we have sort of a schematic representation of what was on it. Um, these schematic representations are going to be very common. A lot of what you read in um, 
in Sumerian is going to be this, where somebody went through this and uh, did the hard work of turning sort of this messy tablet into something a little bit easier to read, <clears throat> and then telling you where all the missing portions are in addition. Also, uh, you'll see here and also up here, we've got these nice lines that separate portions of the written language. Uh, <clears throat> those will be represented on the schematics as well, but they're very helpful for sort of organizing and looking at the layout of what needs to be read. Um, over here we have another example, another clay tablet. This one appears to be a little bit easier to read, although the last one, there might have just been problems with sort of the angle of the picture. <clears throat> um, but we see uh, various signs and the characteristic wedge shapes in this clay tablet. I believe this one is a tablet um, <clears throat> being uh, sent to a king to inform, him, to inform him that his son died in a battle. Um, so kind of interesting, also a lot of portions missing. It doesn't look as bad as maybe the lot, um, this one over here, but um, I don't actually, I haven't gotten a good enough look at either one to really be sure. <clears throat> um, additionally, there are sort of computer typefaces. This is a screenshot of uh, a, essentially a typeface for Sumerian. <clears throat> um, as you can see here, we've got some wedge shapes where the wedge portion seems to go like a lot further down the line <clears throat> than in uh, perhaps uh, this, uh, in these uh, sort of representations. Um, <clears throat> I believe that this is much more common in uh, monumental inscriptions that were sort of on stone, especially in the sort of Akkadian period. <clears throat> um, but either way, you can look at it and um, tell there are clear wedge shapes um, in there, uh, but this is sort of an earlier version of the writing script, uh, writing system than something right here. And the way you can tell is that the uh, vignette sign here is <clears throat> has a particular shape where it's more of a circle rather than um, two lines and then one coming above it and across. Not that you're expected to know that. But this would be sort of an intermediate stage in language that's being represented by this typeface. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a font, essentially, for interpreting uh, the Unicode, <clears throat> sorry, encoding of Sumerian signs. Um, <clears throat> this particular inscription starts off talking about uh, the god Enlil. That's what the Dingir sign is. is it, it, talks, uh, <clears throat> it denotes uh, a, the name of a god. Um, can do some other things too, but the god Enlil, Kukura, um, Lugal Kukura, man or king, or sorry, king of the uh, mountains, mountainous range. <clears throat> and then talks about it being, him being the father of the gods. This uh, sentence essentially was just lifted off of Wikipedia, this page on the Sumerian language. <clears throat> and I just um, put it in uh, Sublime Text, which is a program that uh, has essentially, I, it's got the, the fonts loaded into it for these characters. <clears throat> Sorry about my throat today. Um, anyways, and then that's just a cursor over here. It's not a, a sign. Um, so different ways that you can read it. Um, you'll probably be mostly reading it off of sort of inscriptions like this, um, <clears throat> or Sorry, I guess uh, representations like this, or representations that look somewhat like this, and occasionally typefaces. But you should uh, try to familiarize yourself with the actual um, cuneiform on its native medium, uh, if you have the means to do that at all. There are some compilations of <clears throat> um, essentially photographs taken of these, and you can try your hand at that if you feel so inclined. I think that's good practice. <clears throat> but we should go over the, comp uh, the components of the writing system. So lots of signs in Sumerian, but they fall into well, several different categories. We have phonograms, so <clears throat> uh, signs that denote a uh, particular sound, usually a syllable, right? We have logograms, signs that denote a, an idea, essentially, um, <clears throat> and pictograms, signs that uh, draw a particular thing. Um, so coming back here, 
Um, this right here would be a phonogram. It denotes a sound, kur. Um, <clears throat> this in the dingier sign can be a logogram. Um, it can be uh, to communicate the idea of <clears throat> uh, a god. It can also be a pictogram. It can communicate the um, picture of a star. But it can also be this last thing here, a determinative. Uh, and that's the one I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about because people tend to have less experience with these. Uh, determinative <clears throat> tells you how you should interpret usually the following with sometimes the preceding content. These exist in lots of languages. For example, you have them in um, ancient Egyptian as well. And you have a similar thing in ancient uh, Mayan glyphs. <clears throat> Um, but what it does is essentially says, heads up, what you're about to read is going to be uh, the name of a god here. So that's what the determinative, this ding your sign does. There are other de uh, determinatives, <clears throat> uh, for example, for place names um, that will uh, tell you that what you've read is a place name rather than um, some other, some other, uh, some other uh, name or word. <clears throat> um, as we transliterate, okay, going on to transliteration, um, we read the glyphs and we'll make a transliteration. What a transliteration will be is it's taking the written form <clears throat> and writing down essentially glyph for glyph what we see. Determinatives are generally going to be denoted by superscript, so writing the, the phonetic component a value of the determinative usually to the upper left hand side or if it comes afterward to the upper right hand side of <clears throat> of uh, what it's determining of whatever word it's sort of classifying logograms are transliterated directly so just put the value of the logogram um, numerical subscripts subscripts denote a sign number so if there are three or four signs that make a blah sound then we'll put a three for the third one and a four for the fourth one and those numbers are established by convention for each sign <clears throat> um, and then a hyphen denotes a separation between signs of the same word um, from our transliteration we can then go ahead and make a transcription now a transcription what it'll be is it'll be essentially writing down the sign the sounds of the words as we believe they're actually pronounced in Sumerian. So we do a little bit of cleaning up of the transliteration. We won't use the superscripts generally, but we might use the subscripts. Um, a period will mark the border between morphemes. So uh, a morpheme, for example, in English, morpheme boundaries would be like the word dog represents one unit of meaning. Um, dogs has two units of meaning. It has the dog part and then the S, which marks plural. So if this were a Sumerian transcription, we would write dog, period, s. Sumerian words tend to be much more complex than English words. Not always, but they often are. Um, so this convention makes things um, a lot easier, oftentimes. And it uh, allows the transcriber um, to <clears throat> uh, essentially express um, his opinions on what is what is going on in the word so there, there might be some subjectivity to that uh, because we, we don't necessarily know for certain what the boundaries would be um, zero morphemes are marked usually with a zero and across through it or a null marker I should have put an example of that in there and parentheses mark present but unwritten sounds or morphemes so things that we assume to be there but that weren't, weren't written because um, the scribe didn't feel it necessary to uh, communicate what was there. So sometimes certain morphemes are left off <clears throat> or not written in Sumerian. Um, additionally, something else I should put in here is in transliterations, very often um, certain sounds will be repeated um, because of the nature of, uh, sorry, of the phonemes um, being uh, representing syllables. <clears throat> Um, certain parts of that will be repeated. So, for example, if you wanted to write the word mom in Sumerian, uh, because we use phonograms to represent whole syllables, 
Um, there might not be one phonogram to represent that exact syllable, so we could approximate it by writing ma and then um together. And that obviously leads to the ah sound in there being repeated. In transliterations, we're going to repeat that because we're just writing down what signs were used. In transcriptions, that's not the, the case. We're going to collapse those together <clears throat> to uh, just be one, to just show the one syllable. Um, <clears throat> the next step is translation. So this is an English rendering. Wherever possible, we like to preserve the sort of order and layout of the text. So a line here, a line at the top, should correspond to sort of the first thing in the English translation, if possible. It's not always possible, but just be, be aware of that. <clears throat> um, and that's really all we need to go over for an introduction to the Sumerian writing system. Um, I use these images from Wikipedia and also um, some text from Wikipedia, but it was originally a Sumerian text. I don't think that's been in the public domain for probably 5,000 years, um, <clears throat> the text itself. Uh, but these things, these images, most of them are in the public domain. You can read about their licenses here. Um, there's one of them that is not in the public domain, but can be licensed or can be used so long as um, <clears throat> there's a link to the license uh, provided. So here's my link to that license. And in the next video, we're going to start diving into um, looking at some actual Sumerian text and practicing some of the things we've been talking about with that.